Welcome everyone to the October Craw Lecture. I'm George Craw here with Rafe Shannon Craw. Welcome everyone. The Craw Lectures feature acclaimed UC Santa Cruz scientists and technologists who are grappling with some of the biggest problems of our time. Our COVID-19 response series continues tonight, this time with a look at hardware solutions. Healthcare professionals need to be able to get diagnoses quickly. Tonight, Professor Holger Smith shares the developing technology that could give doctors handheld devices that can deliver tests quickly and on site. This is another example of the advances and promise of nanopore research taking place at UC Santa Cruz. Moderating tonight's discussion is Alex Wolf, Dean of the Baskin School of Engineering and distinguished professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at UC Santa Cruz. Before we begin, I would like to share a few details about tonight's event. We are using a webinar tool, so there is no chat function. We will have an opportunity to answer your questions at the end of the program, and we invite you to submit questions into the Q&A box at any time. Tonight's event will be recorded. Now I'll turn this over to Alex. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. Uh, I really, really want to thank you again, as, as I've done a few times, uh, for the, for the work you've done to make um, our research accessible and available to the general public. It's really important uh, for, for people to be able to share in what it is we're doing and share in the excitement of the work that, that we're, we're doing. Uh, I've been so impressed and frankly proud of the faculty and staff, uh, the students, at Basket Engineering and how they have taken up the challenge of this pandemic. Uh, many of them have pivoted their work, their attention to fighting, uh, fighting the pandemic. And um, that has been a bit of a risk for them, uh, but it is also something that is extremely rewarding and is very much aligned with our values, which is to make a very positive impact on our community. But it's not as though that they hadn't been preparing for this in some sense. And I think that what uh, our work really demonstrates is that the years and years of investment in new techniques, new technologies and experimentation have prepared us for this moment and has actually made it possible for us to so quickly uh, take up this challenge, as I said, and uh, really make some meaningful advances uh, in the fight uh, against COVID. And a great example of that is the work that we're gonna hear about tonight that uh, Professor Hoka Schmidt has been doing with his group for again, for many years leading up to this moment. Uh, but I do wanna take a few minutes to just review some of the other activities that have been going on at Baskin Engineering around uh, COVID. Uh, these range and actually touch upon just about every one of our departments. Uh, so we are, in a sense, taking a very broad, uh, broad front against the fight. And um, I'll start with with one which, in some sense, is pretty basic. Uh, Mircea Teodorescu and his uh, students are using three D printers to print essential swabs to, to prevent to to print PP, PPE equipment uh, to try to expand the available material for uh, protecting, protecting uh, first responders for, and for protecting the community. That's pretty basic work, um, but it's also very important work. Uh, another group of work that we're doing is in the detection uh, and the presence and of the tracking of the, the virus. So uh, you may have heard about, and I believe you've heard about the molecular diagnostic lab, which is being developed. And this is a local, locally grown testing facility in cooperation with uh, Santa Cruz Health uh, to have a capability that's available to the university community and also the local community in particular, people who uh, might not because they don't have insurance or other means have uh, access to, to testing. And as we all know, testing is extremely important for uh, understanding the progression of this, of this virus and of protecting the, the community. Um, David Burnick 
is looking at the detection from another angle, so to speak. He is uh, analyzing sewage uh, to try to locate um, through very massive and, and a gross level, uh, the presence or absence of, of the virus uh, by looking at the outflow from particular buildings. Mark Akison um, is using nanopore technology that you mentioned, George, to do rapid sequencing of the uh, coronavirus samples uh, at a very, very large scale. And this fits into the next thing that we're doing, which is uh, in the Genomics Institute, the Genomics Institute is, is world famous for providing the genome browser, which gives uh, access to scientists around the world to study the genomes in humans and plants and, and other animals. In this case, they created a, a sub piece of the browser, which is dedicated to capturing the genome of the COVID virus and uh, doing so in, that captures all of its, it, captures the virus in all its variations. So it is a resource for uh, scientists and researchers, people who are developing drugs to understand the virus at a very, very fine grain. One of the tools that has been applied to it was developed here uh, by Russ Korbedetic and his postdoc, a, a tool to do um, contact tracing by examining the uh, evolution and the progression of the of the virus genome. So it, what we do is we take we receive samples from around the world uh, of people who have contracted the disease. The genome is sequenced and it's placed in a database. The database right now has about 50,000 samples. And uh, the breakthrough uh, that Russ and his postdoc have managed is to make this an extremely rapid matching process so that we can use it for very quick contact tracing. And they've reduced the turnaround time of these matches from, from many, 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 many hours um, to uh, minutes. And that's an incredibly important tool. In a previous CROT lecture, uh, you heard from Rebecca Dubois. Rebecca is working uh, uh, at the other end of the virus, which is uh, detecting antibodies. So to see who, um, who has, in a sense, recovered from it, who had been exposed to it, and understand um, uh, the immune system uh, reactions to the, uh, to the virus and the immunity that's built up in the, in the body. David Diemer is working on treatment. Uh, this treatment is one a therapeutic aerosol that reduces some of the most impactful uh, side effects of the, of the uh, virus. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simple, the idea is a simple spray that you can take in to protect the lungs. And as you know, the pneumonia and the reaction within the lungs is one of the most dangerous and deadly uh, effects of, of the virus. And then going out of the biotech world, we're into um, work that's being done in the EC department on uh, mathematical models of the virus to allow scientists to understand how it has evolved, evolved uh, and contribute to the decision-making process in how to fight it at a, at a community scale. Um, in the CSE department, Narges Nuruzi is working on remote techniques for examining, uh, detecting patterns in people's breathing, uh, pulse rate and other things to detect the possibility that someone might be subject to the, to the virus, a much less invasive way of, of screening people for the virus. And then of course, if there are symptoms that look, uh, look suspicious, one would then go for a test. Uh, and uh, last, I'll just mention Yang Lu in the CSE department, who is helping with a very different problem, which is the problem of understanding what information that's become available is actually credible information. So as you know, there's a lot of talk on the web, in social media, in, uh, in publications, people are rushing to publish their results so that we can fight this virus quickly. But there's a lot of noise in that. There's a lot of incorrect information. There's a lot of misinformation and disinformation. And he's developing AI tools to try to filter out that noise. So I'm really excited now to turn to uh, Holger and uh, Holger Schmidt's work 
Um, as George said, he has been working on uh, hardware oriented solutions to, um, to detecting the virus and uh, applying his work in optofluidics to make that a very uh, efficient and, and quick. That's, that's really one of the, the main uh, benefits of it, extremely, extremely rapid uh, testing for, uh, for the virus. So let me just introduce Holger very quickly. Uh, Holger uh, holds the Narinder Kapani chair in optoelectronics. He is a professor of electrical and computer engineering. Uh, he directs the Keck Center for Nanoscale Optofluidics. I'm also very, very pleased to say that he is serving as my associate dean for research where he's done a wonderful, wonderful job for the school and for our faculty. Uh, Holger has received a number of awards for his work. Uh, he, had a, 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 he earned a career award um, when he was early on starting out. Uh, he received a Keck Futures Nanotechnology Award, uh, Engineering Achievement Award from the IEEE Photonic Society. He's a fellow of the Optical Society of America, a fellow of the IEEE, and a, recently a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors. So uh, I'm really, really excited to hear about Holger's work and share that work with you. So Holger, please. Thank you, Alex, for the kind introduction. And also thanks, George, uh, for really uh, putting this wonderful events together. I'm really honored to be able to speak here today. And uh, I'm going to share my screen now and start the presentation. So I hope that works. Okay, so you uh, all heard already the title, Hunting for Infection One Molecule at a Time. And uh, I thought I'm actually going to start with a really, really old slide that I put together almost exactly 12 years ago and used for a while in, in, in research talks. Um, at the time, we were actually waiting to hear from the Keck Foundation whether we would get uh, one of their research awards that ultimately funded the Keck Center that you uh, just mentioned, Alex, uh, and actually supported a lot of the work that I'm gonna be talking about today. So at the time we were waiting for that and uh, we were starting to get really tuned in into the idea of looking for single viruses and other pathogens. Uh, on a chip. And what happened exactly was that I was at a conference in Rochester, New York in October um, and gave a talk on uh, photonic devices. And uh, on the morning that I was going to leave, I picked up the USA Today that they had in the hotel and I was gonna read it on the plane. Um, and I did. And so on the flight home, I was reading this article in USA Today from almost exactly 12 years ago. And it is entitled, as you can see, the cover article, The Next Epidemic, Will We See It Coming? And so that caught my attention. And then as I, the flight got longer, I got so desperate, I, I, I leave through the United Airlines uh, magazine. And when you get to the very end of that, you see the flight map. And at that moment, sort of just uh, really made a connection to me where you know I saw that those two things together, that there are a lot of points where an epidemic could start and then it could ultimately get here uh, to us here in the United States, here in the middle. And uh, you know, at that time, even then it became clear that um, we're really at increasing threat of pandemics in a globalized environment where we're all very much interconnected. And there will be a need for rapid, highly sensitive and inexpensive testing for viruses and other pathogens, uh, but in particular viruses. And we would have to control both outbreaks locally at the origin, but as well as controlling ideally uh, entry into, into our country. And that would ultimately point to the need for point of care medicine where you could do these things uh, locally on site. And you know, it's been a while since then, but in that article, which you can't quite read, I think on the screen, they interviewed a public health official from Canada who said uh, that in the context of SARS, that SARS may be a rehearsal for something worse. And so if you look up all the epidemics, outbreaks on Wikipedia over the last decade or two decades that have had more than a thousand fatalities, you see there's quite a few of them. And more or less every year, there's a new one. And you know, here we are now in 2019 with COVID-19 or 2020 now uh, with COVID-19 and uh, exactly what he predicted at the time, which was I absolutely think it's inevitable uh, has obviously happened. 
And so what I'm going to describe today is uh, our approach uh, to detection of these kind of pathogens uh, that might hopefully be useful. But even if, if our work is not going to solve or not, hopefully not going to be needed to resolve the current crisis, as you can see here, I think there will be a need for these type of devices going forward. And I'm sure we're going to face another virus or another pathogen uh, very soon. OK, so uh, what are we talking about specifically in, uh, in the case of COVID? So here you see a, a microscope image, or electron microscope image of the COVID virus, SARS-CoV-2. And they vary in size from about 50 to 200 nanometers. So they're really, really small particles. And they're relatively simple. They basically consist of a shell with some genetic material inside. In this case, uh, it's called RNA, ribonucleic acid. And if we are interested in detecting these kind of viruses and figuring out it's, it's this particular virus, what we usually look for is either the genetic material, so the RNA, or we look at some of the proteins that make up the virus in the case of COVID. The ones of interest that people have been looking at are the nucleocapsid protein, which is inside the shell together with the RNA, or the spike protein on the outside, which produces these, uh, these fascinating spikes on the virus. So you're going to see those again towards the end of my talk uh, when I talk about results. So how are we testing right now? The gold standard for uh, detecting infection is called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, and it's based on looking at the nucleic acids or the RNA. It is very highly sensitive, um, but it is complex. And uh, that's why you usually do it at a centralized lab. You need to run through several cycles in order to create enough RNA uh, to be able to detect it. And there are some sources of uh, failure for even for PCR that can, that can happen because of that process. And of course, because it relies on the effect of the, the ability of making more RNA out of the first copy, it, it only works for nucleic acids. It doesn't work for the proteins. Now, on the other hand, and this is our gold standard, on the other hand, we have the currently developing rapid antigen tests. These are looking for proteins, for example, the nucleocapsid protein here inside. And in that case, how that works uh, in a simplified manner is that you have your target proteins that you're looking for, and you expose them to what's called another a capture antibody that is specific to capturing these little red particles. Um, and uh, once that happens, you expose this to another antibody that also binds specifically to the red particles, and uh, but has a, a fluorescent molecule on it that when you have enough of them, then eventually you get a light signal that you can read out. But it takes quite a few of these detection antibodies to see the results. So this is really not sensitive enough. And uh, even currently authorized antigen tests, uh, the guidance from the FDA is that to not use a negative test as the only means of ruling out an infection. So there are some challenges here. And it also covers only a relatively small range of concentration. And so we're going to try to basically address all these shortcomings for both of these very different techniques with our devices. Now, just to set the stage a little bit more for what our product, our sensor has to be able to do, uh, I'm going to show you a few, four specific things that we have to be able to, to accomplish with, a, with our device to be, to be useful. So here's now the example of another famous virus, the Ebola virus, but things look very similar for uh, SARS and other things. So here in this case, you see here a graph of the amount of RNA in this case, Ebola, over the course of the uh, disease or the illness. And you can see here the black bars, it goes up and then it goes down, as you might imagine it would. And basically what this counts here is how many RNA molecules are in one milliliter, which is about the volume of a little sugar cube here, to give you a perspective. So what does our sensor have to be able to do? Well, the first thing we see from this graph is that we have to be as sensitive, sensitive enough to detect the lowest values that we can see here, especially when people are pre-symptomatic. So that's called the limit of detection. And in, in this case and others, that is about a thousand or 10 to the three viral nucleic acids per milliliter per sugar cube. So that's not, that's a thousand molecules in this whole volume. That's not a whole lot. Well, the second thing you might want to know is you want to monitor the course of the infection of where in the disease people are, and you want to know exactly how many viruses or how many nucleic acids there are. So we have to be able to cover this entire range from uh, 10 to the three to 10 to the nine, or about a thousand to a billion nucleic acids per milliliter. 
and that is called the dynamic range. So in this case, you can see this covers a factor of about 1 million, which we, in the logarithmic scale, we call six logs, so six factors of 10. That is the minimum dynamic range we want to cover. Now, the third point is that we may not know exactly what infection we're looking for or at. Um, here you see a table of all the hemorrhagic fever viruses that cause very similar symptoms to Ebola. Um, and then even within the Ebola virus, you have several subtypes that can be distinguished by their nucleic acids. Um, and you need to be able to figure out which one a person might have. So if you add all these up in this particular case for the Ebola-like viruses, you get about 14 of those that you might want to look for at the same time and be able to tell apart from each other. And that is called multiplexing. And you find that for most infectious diseases, you need to be able to multiplex on the order of five to 10, distinguish between five to 20 different things at once. And then finally, of course, you wanna do that with high specificity, meaning that you wanna be able to be sure to say that you really have found, say, the Zaire Ebola strain. And you're gonna to have to address all of these four issues as we, as we go along. Okay, and just to repeat, there are really very similar requirements for other viral infections, and I will come back to uh, COVID at the very end of the talk, and you will see that play out. Okay, so those are the kind of things that we need to be able to detect, and uh, if we want to do that at the point of care we, with very high sensitivity, we can't always carry around a confocal microscope that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to be able to produce that sensitivity, and so it is... Uh, uh, obvious that we might want to be build something that is integrated and small and take advantage of all the work that's been done in the electronics industry and the optoelectronics industry, especially because all the readouts that you've seen so far are using optical methods. So basically, we want to bring the detection process onto a little uh, device, a, a little chip, and we immediately face a big problem when we do that. And that is what I call the waveguiding problem. So what's that? So we all might have seen uh, an optical effect uh, like this, where if you have this pencil sticking in a half full glass of water, uh, you get this weird distortion here that looks as if the pencil was broken. And that occurs because the two materials, the air on the top and the water on the bottom have what's called two different refractive indices. And here's a table of the refractive index for air, for water, uh, and then for solid materials that we actually might wanna use to build our chip. This is PDMS plastic. This is basically glass, silicon oxide, silicon nitride, and then silicon, which is the, of course, the workhorse for the electronics industry. And all of these have very different refractive index values. And so these kind of effects can occur when you put them together. So now context, uh, you might want to look at a situation like that, where you have, again, a water bottom and the air on top. And if you look at that interface, if you shine light from water out outwards, if it comes in at a really steep angle, then it actually doesn't make it out into the air. Uh, like these two beams, it actually gets completely reflected back into the water. And that's what we take advantage for normally when we use, when we build optical waveguides, like the fiber optical cables that, that carry our data uh, in, the, in the telecommunications world. So in that case, the medium in which the light is guided has a high refractive index uh, compared to the medium that's on the outside. And so inside 1.5, outside one. And so this works very well. And you can see the light being guided in this glass fiber. But we're facing the opposite situation when we're trying to deal with liquid or gas materials on a, on a, surrounded by solids. So in our case, if we look at capillaries, the inside, when it's hollow, has a refractive index of one, which is extremely low. And everything on the outside is at least uh, 1.4 or higher. So that means you cannot guide light in that case uh, by bouncing it off the walls continuously. It will just not happen. And so that was a big problem that we really had to address uh, and we did over a few years. And uh, we basically had to come up with a new way to build what we call holocore waveguides to guide light uh, to the molecules on the chip where we want them to be. And that is basically the, uh, one of the core inventions that we've come up with over the last few years. Um, here you can see one of our uh, optical optofluidic devices, a silicon chip, uh, on which we will carry out the detection that I'm going to discuss in the next few slides. And here you can actually see one of these devices. It's about as big as a thumbnail or 
smaller than, than a quarter here. And when you look very closely, what uh, we came up with is to keep light inside this hollow channel here, this little micro channel, uh, by basically building a little mirror around it with uh, very precisely designed layers, alternating layers of uh, different glasses that basically act as the reflector that make it happen so that the light stays inside this very small channel. Just to give you a size perspective, this channel is about five micrometers high or 12 micrometers wide, which is about a 10 thousandth of an inch. So we're talking about really, really small uh, openings here, but they're big enough to pass the kind of small molecules and even the viral particle that we've been talking about. So I'm going to des describe how we're going to use these, how we use these holoco optical waveguides to actually accomplish single molecule analysis on a chip. Um, and then I'm going to show another little invention that adds the multiplexing capability to it that I mentioned earlier. And then after a little break, I'm going to discuss how we can incorporate nanopores for electrical detection on the same devices um, uh, and also take advantage of optical trapping to do a new way of detecting molecules on these chips. And let's assume you can do all this, then there are many new applications by basically combining all the knowledge from optoelectronics and solid state electronics uh, with non-solid materials like fluids and gases, liquids and gases. And uh, of course, today we're gonna focus on uh, diagnostic applications uh, with bodily fluids like blood or saliva or even nasal swabs, as you will see. But you could also look at water quality or air quality chemical measurements, and because the chips are small, perhaps even send them in space where we find more and more uh, liquids to investigate. Okay, so let's look a little bit more at the, uh, at the chip that I just showed you and the Oral Arrow Waveguide Optofluidic Platform. So here's the chip again as a photograph, and here's in cartoon version what's really happening on there. So basically what we have here are these hollow channels that I showed you on the previous slide in blue. So these are the openings through which we can actually guide uh, the type of uh, molecules here in orange that we want to test for. And those are connected on the same chip with more conventional solid optical waveguides. So you can see here, this is all glass here on the top, but it has this little nub. And that essentially allows us to keep the light here within this about five micrometer wide area. And this is the image of the light being guided through here. So that allows us to connect now uh, the external world of the chip to the uh, fluidic things that are going on on the chip. And how that plays out is as follows. Um, say a molecule gets pushed through the channel and when it gets to this point here in the middle, it reaches the intersection between the solid waveguide and the, the hollow core waveguide or liquid core waveguide. Now, what we do is we bring an optical fiber, much like you saw on the earlier slide, close to the chip and couple light into this a uh, solid rib, and then it moves along and eventually hits the molecule when it passes by, right in this small little volume, which is critical to get down to the single molecule sensitivity that I mentioned earlier. And then the molecule responds, and typically what happens is that it, the molecule or our target emits light at a slightly different color. I'm showing this here as red, and that is called fluorescence, and then we capture that fluorescent signal with these modes or these pattern, light patterns in the hollow channel and we can guide it off to the side and basically put a little silicon photo detector that can basically record the light pulses. Of course, the molecule here doesn't normally stand still. It just flows by and then it keeps going until it gets to the, the waste bucket, if you like. And so we can keep doing this for many, many molecules as we push liquids through the channel. And if we're lucky, uh, at very low concentrations, we see a signal like so, where you basically have a, on our detector a little background level, and then every once in a while, a molecule passes by a light pulse, a light intersection point, and then creates a little light pulse that we collect. And that allows us, in short, to basically now accomplish digital detection of molecular biomarkers. And you can already see that this principle really would apply to anything, essentially, that light when we hit it with the light. So it's gonna be a very flexible platform as you will also see. Okay, so out of the four uh, tasks that we needed to accomplish on the, with this principle in hand, uh, the first one I wanna discuss is how can we be specific for a particular virus target? 
Um, and also because that, that's uh, the one thing that we are basically using established technology for that basically has been around for a long time. <clears throat> but it is important. So the way that works is that we use little magnetic beads. These are again, very small things on the one micrometer scale, um, but they can be functionalized with a little, in this case here, you see a short nucleic acid or DNA sequence. And we, what we put on there is a DNA sequence that matches a particular region of the genome of the thing that we're looking for. So let's say we're looking for the Zaire strain of the Ebola virus. Then we put a little matching thing here that looks for a particular region of that virus. And when that target virus, the Zaire Ebola strain is present, it will do what DNAs do. It will bind to this matching sequence and we can catch it on the magnetic bead. But any other RNAs from a different virus or from, from your own RNA, they will not get pulled onto the bead and will not get captured. So that allows us to pull out the target molecules from a solution. What we do then is we take advantage of the fact that the beads are magnetic, we pull them down to the bottom of the chip, and then we wash away everything else that might still be in the solution. So here the blue or the green RNAs get washed off. And now we've basically purified our, our solution. And the first thing we're doing here is to just stick fluorescent labels onto the captured uh, uh, target RNAs. And then we flow the whole bead through our, our fluidic channel just to see if we have something that, if this matching here works. And you can see here in this case, there's a, an actual detector signal. There's very little going on because we have no target DNAs present. But when we do throw them into the mix, then all of a sudden we get all these individual spikes coming from these beads that contain many, many molecules in this case that are fluorescently tagged. So it works. So we basically can pull out our target, but ultimately we wanted to get to single molecule uh, resolution. And to do that, our final step is to release all our target molecules, say again, the Zaire Ebola strain RNA from our beads. So now they're all back in solution, but now they're purified. And we can do that by just heating everything up briefly. Um, and then we can stick many fluorescent labels on each individual nucleic acid and then run these tagged RNAs into our silicon detection chip. And that, that uh, basically accomplishes the uh, specificity for the process. Now we can do all this uh, upfront sample preparation of the chip in sort of test tubes, but we can also integrate that process itself into a little microfluidic chip of a more standard type. And we collaborated with my colleague, Rich Matthews at Berkeley to uh, basically translate their or transfer their uh, microvalve technology here to UCSC. And the idea is pretty simple. You wanna mix and do all these labeling processes on, on a little chip. Uh, you can do that by having a network of connected microvalves. Um, basically you have here a little uh, membrane that sits on a glass substrate. And if you suck the air out of this top volume here, you pull the membrane up and a fluid can flow past this little green knob. And that way you can make an, a valve go off and on and you move fluids around on the chip. And here's an example uh, of one of the chips we made on a more traditional PDMS device. We're mixing blue and red food dye here in this little sample volume by lifting up these cross-shaped uh, valves in the right, right sequence. And you can see how that is all happening because we're lifting up the valves and pushing fluids uh, from one end to the other. We can move them around and we can purify everything with water from this third inlet uh, at the end. So basically this is of course just food dye, but we can do all that with our little microbeads and the fluorescent markers and we can mix everything together on this little device. And we did that. Uh, we combined this fluidic chip and our detection chip uh, with this tubing here and the results that I'm gonna show you next. And we can scale this all up. This was done in collaboration with a group at Berkeley to a much bigger wafer scale. And we can basically put these two chips together in a much more intricate way, way and much more functional in these pre-commercial prototype cartridges that you can basically shove into an instrument reader. And basically all the sample preparation and detection happens on this little uh, handheld uh, disposable cartridge. So now we have all the tools in hand, I think, to actually see if we can hunt for a single molecule. And we were able to do that a couple of years ago. And uh, the first results I'm gonna show you are, uh, in fact, 
detecting sort of infected Ebola cells uh, with this exact exceptional resolution. And that was highlighted by the NIH director at the time and uh, also by was the top story at the NSF Science 360 News website. So it caught quite a bit of attention. And basically uh, what you see here is the result of looking for the Zaire Ebola strain, uh, individual RNA molecules being pushed through our little chip. Um, and the samples came from our collaborators at the Texas Med Biomedical Research Institute. Um, and you can see here exactly the kind of signal I promised earlier, which is here's the time, two seconds only. And here's the optical readout of our detector. And you can see for this very low concentration of virus, we just get three blips uh, corresponding to three nucleic acids directly detected. And then as we increase the concentration by factors of 10, you can see how we get more and more of these blips, and which makes sense because more and more molecules get pushed past our optical laser beam. And so it doesn't matter in this case whether the, the peak is high or low. This is just uh, how well we detect the light. It just matters that we can see them at all above a certain threshold. And so we can basically count these as, as ones, as digitized events, and you can see how that event rate goes up very quickly with the concentration. So we did this very systematically, and what you can see here is essentially just how many of these blips we got per sample volume um, for many, many different concentrations of uh, viral RNA that we tested. And so the, the red and the blue curve are uh, both the on-chip sample preparation and the off-chip sample preparation when we had the uh, Zaire Ebola strain that we were looking for. And you can see that the count rate goes up uh, in a linear fashion, basically with the amount of virus we put in, and we can do that over many factors of 10. So between here and here is a factor of 1 million in concentration difference. So that is uh, covering exactly the six orders of magnitude that I mentioned earlier. And then when we test the process with the wrong virus, say the Sudan strain of the Ebola or the Marburg virus, we get zero counts on our detector, no matter how high the concentration is. So that takes really proves uh, nicely how the method was really sensitive, uh, specific to begin with. Okay, so what we had here was single nucleic acids in uh, clinical samples, so uh, infective uh, cell cultures in this case. Um, we can count them directly, so we don't need the amplification process that we use in PCR today. And we basically covered the entire uh, clinically relevant range for that type of infection. We did that with excellent specificity on a, over a very wide uh, range of concentrations. So that covers three of the four targets that our sensor had to accomplish. And if you remember, the fourth one, uh, that was the, that we didn't prove here yet, was the ability to look for several things at once or multiplexing. And in order to accomplish that and build that into our little chips, we had an, another idea that uh, uh, we, we turned into reality here use a basically integrated photonic approach. And that also was highlighted uh, by the NSF as one of their top stories. And uh, in order to explain that real quick, uh, I need to back up for, for one second. So if you recall, what comes in from the side of the chip is these uh, small waveguides that carry the light to the liquid channel. And the way we've been doing it so far is that we kept these ridges here very narrow and they can only basically carry this little light pattern, this little circular light pattern to the channel. And that's what we call a single mode waveguide and it, it is, has its benefits. But what happens when we make this ridge much wider? So if you look from the top down, uh, you now have a much wider optical waveguide that guides the light. And in that case, you can start to actually transport other light patterns as well. And because light consists out of waves, uh, they can interfere with each other. And uh, as a result of that, you get very strange light patterns as you move uh, in this wide waveguide from the left to the right. So the way that looks here is as follows. Uh, so the light expands and then eventually you get these very uh, cool looking patterns um, and eventually goes back to a single point, but uh, that's not what we're interested in here. What we're looking for here is the fact that, say, at this part, right at the half of this length, we actually have two very nicely defined light spots. And here we have one, two, three, and here we have one, two, three, four, and so on. 
So these uh, distances at which these spot patterns occur, we can actually predict. So we get n spots at a point, a particular length L that is determined by the material index of the waveguide by how wide it is and what color or wavelength we're using for the light that we send through. So how can we take advantage of that for multiplexing virus detection? Well, first of all, here's a, a microscope image of what that actually looks like in, in real life. So here's our fluidic channel that would contain the molecules. And here is our original very narrow excitation waveguide. And here's our much minor interference waveguide. So what happens is that we've designed the chip in such a way that the light pattern right at the location where the channel crosses uh, comes together in a nice pattern. So in this case, you would cross at the point where you have one, two, three, four, five, six uh, optical spots. And so if you envision now a viral particle flowing through, it will get hit by the light six times and it should respond accordingly. And it really does. So here's an actual signal of, uh, in this case, an influenza virus that we tagged with fluorescent markers. And you can see here the uh, light signal on the detector and then all of a sudden we get one, two, three, four, five, six spikes, which means that we have uh, detected this individual uh, viral particle. All right, let me go back to the laser pointer. So this works really well. And to do multiplexing, now we can take advantage that of the fact that the, the equation I showed you earlier depended both on the spot number n as well as, as the light color, uh, which is the wavelength lambda. And that those two together are a, a constant for each chip. So that means that for a different wavelength, a different color, we can actually get a different number n to keep that product the same. And so on this particular chip, what that means is that if we shine blue light through the chip, we're creating one, two, three, nine spots in the fluidic channel. With red light, we create seven. And with a darker red, we create six spots. So now that gives us the power to do uh, weight multiplexing with, with color on the single molecule level. So here we have what we sent through here were three viruses, three influenza strains, H3N2, H2N2, and H1N1, or swine flu. And one of them got tagged with dark red, one with red, a color and one with blue. And sure enough, when we send each of one of them through the device, we see optical signals that have either six peaks, seven peaks, or nine peaks. And also the spacing and time between those peaks is characteristic because if you have fewer of those, the spacing between them is larger. So much bigger spacing here than down here. And that allowed us by simply in a sense, counting the number of peaks for each one of these signals to distinguish between a blue, a red, and a dark red particle, or these three different influenza strains. From a, and here you can see a result of a mixture of those being flowed through the chip uh, and detected one by one uh, with, with really high accuracy. Now, if you want to push that to the limit that I mentioned earlier, so about a dozen targets, then you would need a dozen colors, but that is not a very good idea. It becomes very cumbersome to use many different laser sources. So instead, what you can do is you can use combinatorics. And a very simple example here is that we took the same three viruses, but only used two colors. And in this case, the middle virus was labeled with the blue and the dark red that we used only for the H1N1 and H3N2 respectively. So what that means is now that you still get three distinguishable signal signals, one will have six spikes for red, one will have nine spikes for blue, and one will have sort of this mixture of signals with both six and nine at the same time, and it looks a little funky. But using signal processing, we can basically establish that this mixed signal has content from both this time spacing here and the larger one here. So in other words, we're basically having a red channel that only responds to H3N2. We have the blue channel, and when that's only present, we have H1N1. And when you have both blue and red channel uh, signal content, then you have a H2N2 virus. So when you scale that up um, and you say you tag an opaque acid with three colors, you actually get seven distinguishable uh, color combinations between red, green, and blue that would translate to these seven different combinations uh, of uh, of channel content, right? And so with three colors, you can get seven targets. 
And with four, you're already up to 15, which is more than you need in most practical cases. And we proposed that a couple of years ago, and we uh, just recently, uh, earlier this year, published a paper on doing exactly that uh, using different targets. In this case, we were looking for bacterial targets, which are also a big problem, especially uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. In this case, to the sort of the last uh, resort, antibiotic carbapenem. So here we looked for seven things consisting of three bacteria and four of these uh, resistance genes. Um, and as I said earlier, so basically we tagged E. coli bacteria DNA with dark red and uh, KPC targets with red and so on until we had this three color combination. And then we really looked at a mixture of all these seven targets all flowing through a chip at the same time. And uh, they all produce different signal patterns that we then analyzed uh, again with good accuracy. And we can pick out all seven of these different targets from the mixture all at once. So uh, in this case, the application is sepsis, bacterial infection, but of course this can also apply to viral infection and other, other biomarkers that you might be looking for. All right, and the last point I would like to make with regards to the optical fluorescence detection is uh, a point that I raised earlier, which is that current, current methods for uh, looking for COVID-19, for instance, either look at the nucleic acids or the protein or antigen biomarkers. And our chip really can do both as opposed to the current uh, gold standard methods, which can only do one, of, one or the other. So in order to prove that we, made a little experiment where we had our magnetic beads and one looked was functionalized with a DNA pull down. Like I said earlier, that looked for Zika nucleic acids. And then we tagged that with red uh, fluorescent markers. And at the same time, we, looked, we prepared magnetic beads that were functionalized with an antibody protein that looked for the Zika NS1 protein. And that was then tagged with green with a secondary antibody as in very much like the current ELISA process. And then we flowed both of these uh, magnetic beads through our device using, uh, again, our interference-based chip to look for the DNA with a red color and seven, seven spikes. So any signal that has seven humps would be uh, a DNA. And then anything that gets excited with green and produces eight spikes, that is a protein. So just by counting the spike number, again, the peak number, we can simultaneously look for proteins and DNAs on the, on the same chip. And I think this is probably a good time to break for a moment uh, if there are any questions for this part of the talk before we move on to the, the nanopore section. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Hold on a second. Okay, there we go. There you go. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Holger. Um, yeah, this is just a little break to uh, give a chance for some for some questions, and um, uh, we have some questions here. The first uh, question, Holger, actually has to do with the the colors that you're just sh showing. So you know, you, if I understood right, there were. Uh, Interpreting this question, uh, if I understood right, there, were, there you, you had two factors. There's the color, and then there's the number of of these these the number of these spots. Um, so, is there some other way besides tagging with colors, different colors? Can you use the other factor? Right. So uh, basically, what the the principle was was that. Uh, in this case, the color information was translated into the number of spots, right? Uh, so in this case, for the red, it was seven, for the green, it was eight. And you actually didn't have to use a, uh, a color analysis at all. It was all in sort of the, the, the number of the spikes. Another way to accomplish that same effect is, if I go back for one second, um, is here, if you look at, this position, you create two spots, and at this position here, three, and here, four. So another way to multiplex is to have three fluidic channels run through these three different locations, and then any particle that flows through this channel will have four spikes, and any particle that flows through that channel here will have two. And so that was is what we call spatial multiplexing, and that works as well. And uh, we 
you can actually combine both of those together, uh, spatial and color multiplexing, so multiple channels and multiple colors. And we have used that, for example, to use only two colors to detect six different, basically the whole gamut of a influenza viral panel with six, six different targets. So this combinatorial approach really gives you a lot of flexibility and, and power. Right. Uh, another question uh, has come in, um, and the question is, um, I'll just read it, is likely you would find multiple virus, is, is it likely you would find multiple viruses concurrently? Um, as sort of one half of the question, the other half of the question is, if you are studying a new virus, how do you categorize it? Okay, great. that was a great question. So <laughs> the first question I think I want to address at the end, because uh, one thing that we've been, uh, that has been on my mind and everybody else's too, is that now that we're heading into flu season, uh, we might be looking, somebody feels sick and how do we know they have uh, the coronavirus or the regular seasonal flu or perhaps just the cold. And so that is a very uh, timely uh tiny example for how you might want to look for two different viruses at the same time. And I'm going to show some actual results on that. Okay. All right. And, and the second part was, uh, the second question was very different about what if I don't know what the virus is? And that is, uh, that is something that our device does not address. That's correct. So at the beginning, let's say when we first discover there's a disease that's outbreaking, we really need to have the sequencing power to figure out what is the genome, what is, what is the pathogen. Uh, but that always happens very quickly. And once that is in the data bank, which happened early in this outbreak as well, then we can come in and we can pick out a specific section of that genetic information and then build our little uh, targets, uh, our little magnetic beads around that. But initially you need a different approach to actually figure out exactly what the virus is that you have at hand. Which would work for viruses that sort of seasonal viruses will, and certainly, a pandemic virus in which it takes time for it to move move around the world. You can uh, sort of equip equip yourself by building the special devices that will cheaply detect detect those virus specific viruses. Is that right? Right. So um, you know, by the end of this, the devices are basically the chips are basically built and they're ready to go. And then all we need is to wait for the first sequence to be published. Basically, pick out a specific part of that sequence and then. We can order these these the reagents here that we use to to capture the virus on the beads. That that happens within a few days. We can order those commercially. Uh, uh, one more question, and I guess we should return um, to the talk. Uh, it's kind of a question of of how the the little the little chip works. Um, how is the fluid actually moved through the through the chip? Yeah, so in our case, uh, in the lab currently, so we use pressure basically and the way we do it in the lab downstairs is that we basically put vacuum on one end and we suck the liquids through from the other end. But, you know, the other way is to apply positive pressure and push from one end and uh, that's kind of, uh, you can do that too by applying a, just a little microfluidic pump. So how, how would that basically. work in the field then, you know, take this out into some community somewhere and and we're using it as a detector, how would you do it? Right, so either um, either you just have a little cheap little pump associated with that, that you can have solar power or something, and these are neither expensive nor very complicated. Or you could, uh, which we haven't done yet, uh, you could build a device that uh, is based on capillary action and basically uses, uh, you know, wicks the liquids through these very small capillary channels, which they are. Right, and then it sort of gets pulled through to capillary reaction without an external uh, external pump power source. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I guess let's then return to the second part of your talk. Okay, hey, thanks, Alex. So um, the second and a little bit shorter part of my talk uh, is, is building on this theme here and is intended to show how we can use the same initial chips, but in a very uh, complementary way to still detect single molecules. Um, and that is basically the integration of uh, nanopores onto these devices. And uh, as, nano, as Alex mentioned at the beginning, and many of you probably have heard of, 
Uh, nanopores are something that was invented here uh, by David Diemer and uh, workers at Harvard, but uh, we have really a long history here at UCC of uh, nanopore science and uh, commercialization, especially in the, in, with the main application being the sequencing part that I mentioned earlier, just figure out what exactly, what kind of genes you're looking at. Um, in our case, as you will see, the, the immediate goal is not sequencing, but again, to provide a, a recognition element, basically a counter for something that you have already sort of uh, isolated. So for those of you not familiar with an, this really simple but beautifully elegant nanopore concept that uh, Dave came up with uh, a few years ago, um, here's a little cartoon that shows what's happening. Imagine you have a little a membrane, like a little plastic sheet, and you punch a hole in it. Um, and here's a side view of that sheet with the hole. And uh, you will have a liquid on both sides that has ions in it. And uh, what you can do is that if you apply a battery voltage across the, from the top to the bottom, then the ions, the negative ions might move down and the positive ions might move up. And that gives you an electrical current that's going through that little hole. Now, the nanopore detection idea is that uh, you get a, this current, this ionic current, when you apply the, the battery. And uh, when a little object goes through that opening, it blocks the hole just a little bit. And therefore, fewer ions can go through the hole because it's partially obstructed. And as a result, you get this little dip in the current signal. And if you, every time you see that dip, you know that a particle has passed through. And it basically is like a counter, in this case, for this one little golden object to move through. <clears throat> and the object itself is typically charged, and which is, in the case of molecules, uh, not really a problem because DNA is very heavily negatively charged. And so you can, by applying this voltage, the DNA itself will get sort of feel that electric pull from the other side and wants to move through that hole. So that's the idea. Um, and uh, when I came to UCSC, I met with Dave, and I just found this really fascinating and always wanted to put that on, a, on one of our integrated devices. And so in our context, what we envisioned back then was to what we call add a smart nanopore gate to the optofluidic chip. So basically a little opening, a little door that regulates what gets into this fluidic channel and does so with a basically individual molecule resolution. So let one person through the door at the time, if you like. So you might recognize this cartoon image from earlier. This is our uh, standard optofluidic chip with a fluidic channel and here the, op the solid waveguides in green. But what we've done here now is to add this third bucket. And uh, basically that is where we add the nanopore. Let's say we have a nanopore somewhere down in this, uh, in this hole here. If we bring molecules in here and we apply electrodes and an electrical voltage, we can again basically pull these, uh, in this case, these little pink molecules into the fluidic channel one by one. And if that really works, then that should give you this current drop, this current signal that I mentioned earlier. And then the molecule keeps going, uh, either electrically or uh, by pressure. And once again, it gets to this optical intersection point where you can hit it with a laser beam and it, it in its fluorescence. And you should also get an optical signal on the same chip, right? A little bit later in this case, because it took some time to move from the nanopore uh, to this optical excitation point. So we basically are capable here now at UCC to basically mill these little nanopores into our uh, silicon chip by using what's called a focused ion beam. That's basically a stream of gallium ions that bombard uh, our chip like little pellets and they're basically drilling a hole into this little uh, membrane of our of optical waveguide. And that allows us to make uh, these small holes. This is about 50 nanometers in size here using just this uh, little stream of gallium ions bombarding uh, the membrane. And that allows us to say, put uh, uh, a virus through or DNA or protein. And just as a summary of some of the work we've been accomplishing over the last few years, uh, the first major step was to really show the fact that we can do both electrical and optical single molecule analysis uh, on the same chip. We did that with uh, influenza viruses that are about 100 nanometers in size and that we tagged fluorescently so they would respond to the light. And we moved them through a 150 nanometer pore 
And here you can see the electrical signal showing the nanopore blockades uh, that I mentioned earlier. And uh, on the bottom, you see the optical signal showing the fluorescence of these attack uh, viruses. And there's a perfect correspondence one-to-one -one between those two. So this was also the final proof that these red spikes here are really coming from single uh, molecules, in this case, single viruses. So this was the first chip, I think, that really had this single molecule detection resolution for, uh, for both in, in two ways at the same time. And more recently, uh, last year, we added to that by basically adding a control to the electrical circuit so that our chip now automatically recognizes when a molecule goes through. So here you can see the spike, meaning that in this case, a, a ribosome is going through the opening. And at that point, we automatically recognize that and we turn off the electrical voltage across the pore. We drive that down to zero. And then no more uh, particles will get into the channel. So we can really introduce individual molecules into the channel and we can even uh, pick which ones or we can sort them after the fact. And you can see this one single molecule, uh, this actually a DNA molecule here, uh, then producing the optical signal. And it's just this one that, that got into the channel. So we have a lot of control now over these devices. But in the context of our viral detection, uh, I would like to introduce one more idea here. And that is the idea that uh, of optical forces um, because uh, light can actually push, can really exert a force. And that uh, was finally recognized with a Nobel Prize in physics a couple of years ago. So if you imagine you have a little object, uh, can imagine what they will be in a second, but if you hit an object of, with light, a photon, and uh, if the object is reflecting, then the light will bounce back. But because it has a momentum, when you change the momentum from right to left, as a result of that, you will uh, exert a force on the object here that you're bouncing off, much like if you throw a ball against uh, another ball to, to an, on a pool table, let's say. And so just by shining light on an object, if the object is not too heavy, then you can actually push it uh, as the light bounces back in, as a reaction. And that's called a scattering force. And it's proportional, the bigger the force, the, the force gets bigger, the more the powerful the light is. Now, a second important component is that the light, uh, the, the particle likes to move towards the part of the light beam where the light is most intense. So I'm showing that here with dark red. And that's called the gradient force, meaning that the, there's a force towards higher intensities of light. So what that would mean is that an object would get pulled towards the high, highest, the brightest regions of an optical beam. And so once we had a few years ago uh, in 2008, we finally had our chips working well enough so that we could try and see if that's actually possible on our little optofluidic devices. And uh, that was one of the only things where we had, uh, I remember we had this idea in the morning and in the afternoon we had uh, the first, first result that was really wonderful. Doesn't always happen. Um, but I just wanted to show you this movie of here's our fluidic channel that we've been talking about earlier. It's 12 microns wide and filled with water. And here's a little microbead, much like the magnetic beads we talked about earlier. It's one micron in size and it will just start to diffuse around here and jiggle a little bit. And then we're gonna turn on the laser beam that comes in from left to right. And so particles jiggling, now the laser's gonna turn on and boom, all of a sudden it starts moving. And we're moving the camera so we can keep track of the particle as it gets pushed along here. So it really gets quite fast. And uh, as you can see, as you hopefully saw, it also got pulled towards the center of the channel because of this gradient source force, because that's where the optical mode is the brightest. So that worked great. Now, what we came up with then is to build a new way of actually trapping objects or holding them in a particular place. And we could simply do that by having not just the beam going from left to right, but another laser beam going from right to left. And you know, as they go from one end to the other, they get a little bit weaker. So the force gets a little bit less and less as, the, as you go along that, that beam because it gets less bright. So as a result, if you put a particle into that channel, uh, at this location here, it would get pushed more by the, by the right beam because it's still brighter. Uh, and then therefore it moves to the left. 
And then at this point right here in the middle, both beams are bright, equally bright, and therefore the, they push with the same amount of force from both ends, and you can hold the particle at that location. Now, we've expanded on that by saying, what if we have more than one? And we basically created the analog of a, an optical leaf blower where we just used, instead of air, we used light to basically assemble a whole bunch of particles, uh, the analogy being leaves, uh, what does a leaf blower do? It piles them all up into one giant heap, right? And without actually ever touching the leaves. And so without ever touching little objects in our channel, we can just use light to basically assemble them all in one spot. And so the cartoon version would be to have the two uh, purple trapping beams that push, and then they assemble everything uh, here in this one location. And we were able to actually show that in this little movie that's going to play in a second. So here's our fluidic channel again, and you will see these little uh, these little particles. Those are the fluorescent beads, and uh, as you will see, when we turn on the light, they will get assembled into a single spot here, where we can excite them to fluoresce. So here you can see them jiggle around. We now see only the fluorescence, and you can start as they come together, and you start forming a bigger and bigger cloud. Here's a big chunk coming in. And this, this heap of uh, little microspheres, fluorescent microspheres is starting to get really big and quite bright. So this actually works. So this is all just assembled, this big bright blob with uh, laser beams from left and right. In this case, it was 120 of those microbeads and we see uh, 60 times bigger, brighter fluorescence. So back in 2009, that was just sort of an, an optics uh, idea, right? Um, but as time went on, this turned out to be actually useful in the context of the nanopores that I was talking about. So we put all this together last year in, uh, in, in basically trying to solve one of the issues that uh, nanopore detection faces in general. And uh, sort of this last component here is the following. So we had the nanopore and if a DNA is very close to the nanopore, it feels this big electrical pull that drags it through the hole. But that pull is really only noticeable when you're very, very close to the opening, only a few micrometers. Uh, it's much like when you run, walk through your house with a vacuum cleaner, only the dust particles that feel the pull from the vacuum cleaner directly under it get pulled in and everybody, everything else is not affected. So in most instances, the DNAs are just everywhere and they don't really get close enough to the nanopore to really feel that pull and get through. So how can we improve this detection efficiency uh, and make the nanopore detection process much faster and much more efficient. And so that's where our optical trap comes in. And so basically what we did is, as you saw earlier, we can trap these uh, microbeads at a, at a specific location using the light beams from the left and the right and pull them all together. And so now, instead of just having microbeads, we functionalize them once again, like earlier with the uh, the target molecules that we're looking for. So now you can imagine these little microbeads are the carriers that drag thousands of DNAs to the location right below the nanopore. And uh, when we assemble them, so now we have all these microbeads containing many, many little DNAs. And then we say, turn on the heat. Uh, then they come off the DNAs and they get sucked. They feel the, immediately feel the nanopore field and they get all pulled through very quickly. And that really works. So we did this with Zika nucleic acids that we trapped on beads or pulled down on beads. And then the beads were located under the nanopore. And you can see how with more and more beads trapped, the number of blockade signals goes up dramatically. Uh, we saw an almost 100%, uh, sorry, 100 times uh, bigger detection rate uh, in this first trial that, that we published last year. So I'll come back to that uh, one more time in just one second. But let me finally uh, turn the bend here and uh, come back to our starting point, which was COVID-19 detection. So just as a quick reminder of what we're trying to do, we can either look for the RNA of the virus to look for infection or active infection or the antigens, um, and normally use PCR or ELISA to look for those. Um, or we can look later and see what the host response is. Uh, let's say your body has actually developed antibodies. Those are also proteins and that those come later, right? And then they increase and this would be for later antibody 
analysis. And again, we can do all of these things uh, on our chip uh, because it's target agnostic. And just for reference here, the published sort of amounts of viral RNA per milliliter per sugar cube um, over the course of disease for COVID. And again, if you remember the earlier numbers I showed you, these are very similar in terms of uh, how many RNAs there would be in a milliliter, much like Ebola. So we're in a comfortable range here, uh, as well as with the amount of the nu uh, nucleocapsid protein, the antigen that the antigen tests are producing. These are sort of on the order of uh, 70 picograms per milliliter, which is a, a pretty, pretty normal load that we can handle. And so we've been working quite a bit over the last few months under pretty difficult conditions to try and implement these detection events on our devices for specifically COVID. And I just wanna show uh, at the end here, the first examples. Um, and we're focusing here on, on the antigen detection test because that really is the one that suffers from sensitivity issues. So we basically built up um, again, our beat selection with a uh, anti-COVID specific antibody. And so if the COVID protein, the nucleocapsid protein is present, it will bind to that antibody. And then what uh, one of my students has done over the last year or two, and really with a lot of hard work is to basically build a, a probe, a fluorescent probe that is really very bright so that uh, even if it attaches to just one nucleocapsid protein, we can see that, that probe uh, with enough brightness on our, on our devices. And so we then release that probe by using a light to cut that uh, speci specifically designed to break this chemical bond. And so if the original COVID target is present, this bright probe attaches um, and then we can later release it. And then we should send this thing here through our detection chip. Just as a reminder, this is the fluorescence detection now. And we can indeed see that when the nucleocapsid uh, protein was present, we can detect individual of these probes corresponding to single antigen molecules in the original sample. And we made sure that when we use a different antigen, say Zika, then there would be no binding here and the, the probe cannot attach to the bead and uh, the, there will be none in the, in the detection chip. And that's true, there's no signal uh, when you have a non-matching target. So again, we can do this single protein resolution and high sensitivity. And to basically answer the question from earlier, why, why would you look for two things? Uh, so we've been looking at influenza and COVID at the same time, again, on the single antigen level, using combining our interference waveguides. So we have red probes, which will produce seven spots uh, for COVID, and we have green probes, which will produce eight spots uh, for influenza. And we were able recently to actually test that in uh, nasal swabs that we received from, the, from our own molecular diagnostics lab. And I would really like to thank uh, the whole team that uh, took the time and, and put up with us and gave us these samples, these swab samples, uh, so we could test this. So uh, Michael Stone, Jeremy Sanford, Olena Vasquez, John McMillan, and all their team really doing a great service here and really appreciate they letting us have these samples. And indeed, we can see both influenza antigens and COVID virus in, with single molecule resolution um, on these devices um, at the same time, and we can distinguish them. And finally, this is a little bit less far along because we started the research later on the nanopores. Uh, here's a bunch of nanopore signals using this trapping enhanced uh, method that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but again, now in this case for RNA, COVID RNA, not the antigen. So we can also detect single COVID RNAs uh, on a device using the nanopore approach. Uh, just skipping ahead here. And uh, my last slide here is uh, just giving you an outlook. So I hope that I've shown you that optofluidic devices can be quite powerful and uh, hopefully find an application in molecular diagnostics. Um, just where we're going from here, and especially with a view towards um, the point of care eventually, even though they are also useful in a lab bench setting. But if I really want to think about point of care, some of the things we're currently working on uh, are, first of all, higher level of integration. So we're building these devices that have on a single chip here, both the microfluidic sample handling, as well as the optical readout, 
And even recently, we've put in a laser source on the same chip that produces laser light here in this, in this red section to then interrogate the fluidic channel here in blue. Uh, so that is sort of towards the vision of really putting everything into one little robust uh, element with fewer moving parts, basically, and fewer things that can go wrong. Our devices are very uh, for forward looking in the sense that they can uh, match up with other detection technologies. So we already have a collaboration with a colleague and in Rochester on doing CRISPR based detection that just got the Nobel Prize last week or two weeks ago uh, for chemistry. And that will be a revolutionary technique to actually produce bigger signals uh, that will be very helpful for our devices. We're working on improving detection capabilities as well as signal analysis. Uh, I don't want to say much about these colorful pictures, but just to say that for the point of care, what we're really trying is to do is to come up with methods that allow us to get the most out of the signals that we get on the device without making everything more expensive. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, all the people that have contributed to this work over the years. Um, as well, all of my students over the years, uh, I can't even uh, highlight individuals, but uh, at this point, um, but it's really a team effort and I'm really grateful for all their hard efforts and uh, the fun work. Uh, I would also like to thank my long-term collaborator and friend, Aaron Hawkins at BYU, who has been helping with fabricating these silicon devices and uh, Gene Patterson from the Texas Biomed Institute on the Ebola and Zika virus samples, which Matthews at Berkeley and of course, Dave Diemer was inspiration on the nanopore work. I'd like to thank all the founding agencies that have helped us uh, as well as UCSC for all the support that has gone into this. And I'll be happy to take any additional questions that come in at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Holger. Um, it was really, really fascinating work. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I was, I was sitting there, I was struck by the fact that uh, the cartoons that you showed make this look so simple. And yet, you know, I can, I know it's not so simple. And I think what also kind of gets lost in it, in the picture is, is how small we're talking about. I mean, these are things that are, are absolutely microscopic, uh, which is, which is really, really, really impressive. Um, and yet, you know, the way you describe it is, almost uh, one can imagine them in, in, in life, you know, moving around through channels and, and other such, such, such images. Um, but at those scales, it's, uh, it's really incredible. So I will um, do a bit of moderation here of questions. Uh, first question is um, actually about the, these beads. Um, it, it, it almost seems like they're, you know, they're, they're a complication in some ways. Is, can, you, can you do this, for example, the trapping without the beads? Can you, can you ah. trap things directly? That's a great question. So um, what you ideally would like to do would be to just trap the target molecules themselves, so if you understand the question correctly. But the trick, the problem with those is that they are so much smaller. They're nanoscale particles, so they're about a thousand times smaller than the microbeads, which are also small. But the optical forces that you can use to push, they scale. They don't scale well when things get really, really small. So, at some point, the it, you you would need a huge laser power to trap a molecule, basically. And so it is smarter and easier to actually just trap a bigger carrier bead which also has the additional function to sort of do the pre-selection because they capture specifically what we're looking for upfront, right? But there are, there's a different type of trap that it, I didn't have time to talk about uh, that works slightly differently that can use lower powers to get down to single molecules. But for this purpose, the beads are better. Great, um, let's see. S so this is a, a, more, a more generic question. Um, how accurate is this technique at detecting the viruses that are mutating very fast, right? So this gets at the same sort of this question of what, do, what I know um, before, what I, what I need to know beforehand about the virus um, sure. in order to be able to build a device. 
So, I mean, it would basically depend on whether, so, so that the, the pull down sequence that we use to capture the virus target on, uh, on our beads is about 20 nucleotides long ballpark, few tens of nucleotides. So unless the mutation happens right at that particular segment, uh, they would still work. So if a different part of the viral genome changes, we could still capture it. Otherwise we would have to redesign the probe and look for, make a new set of beads that are hunting for the <laughs> for the mutated virus. Yeah. In fact, so you could do both, right? You could use it. We could we could build beads for that specific purpose, right? That look for the mutations. How many of that rotation versus that one do you have present in your sample? Okay. Another question is uh, also trying to to push the boundaries of this technique. Uh, You've talked a lot about uh, viruses and contagious viruses. Uh, what about other sorts of, of disease, um, whether it be cancer or, or anything else? Uh, can you use these techniques for that purpose? Yes, absolutely. And you know, I, I briefly mentioned, uh, probably got lost in the shuffle, but one slide was on detecting bacterial infections, right? Um, that's obviously very similar to viral infections, but still different, different problems. And uh, we have worked and used our interference waveguides to actually do multiplex detection of cancer biomarkers, starting from blood. In that case, it was for two melanoma biomarkers, uh, because in that case, you're also looking for, as either to detect cancer or to monitor the disease when you treat it, uh, you can look for either protein markers or nucleic acids. And I think that's another case where our devices with the ability to detect both types of very different biomarkers at the same time could come in very handy. So cancer is another big one. And um, I don't know if it's somewhat, somewhat related, can you use it for uh, sort of a, as an historical tool and go back to uh, samples that may, maybe, maybe old, right? So I think the example in the question was, uh, you know, we'd like to know where, where and when this virus started so we can sort of track down uh, the source of, source of, of a series of infections and, and such. So can you use it for that purpose to do sort of an, uh, an, an archeology span <laughs> study? Um, That's an interesting question. So um, I guess if there's still, nucleic acids around, they, you know, that doesn't mean the virus is still infecting, but they might still be there. And then if you sort of swab a, a surface or something, put it in solution and then look for any remnants of the nucleic acids, for example, uh, viral RNA, you, you should still be able to capture them. Yes, so it should be possible. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, can you distinguish uh, live or active uh, virus RNA versus inactive? Can you, can you use it for basically distinguishing between the two? Right, so that, that is <laughs> probably, so that's not, uh, that's not our sort of core expertise and that would be a great collaboration with say someone like Rebecca at UCSC or, or others. But as I just mentioned, I think that just the mere presence of the nucleic acids or the RNA does not mean that you have infecting virus. Um, so nucleic acids alone might not be sufficient. Um, however, because we can also look for the antigens, uh, I think that's a better indication as well as the whole viral particle, right? I showed earlier that we were able to detect influenza viruses, but the whole thing, right? Because we tagged it fluorescently. So um, if you have the whole virus present, we can look for that, for instance, and see if we have whole viruses present as well, if, if they're still having all the proteins inside. But we have not explored that, uh, that particular angle. This is a question perhaps about commercialization in a sense. So one of the observations is that the pandemic is something that has kind of come upon us very quickly. Um, the sequencing was done uh, relatively quickly and then 
posted uh, online actually at, on the genome browser. But uh, how long, just to give us a, a sense, uh, how long would it take you to spin up a device uh, for some particular disease? Once we've, once we've done the, the sequence, we kind of know what the marker is, uh, how long would it take you to turn it into something that you could actually deploy into the field? Right. So, well, in our particular case, on our devices for the research lab, we, we did spin it up in a few weeks. Uh, once, once, as you said, the, the genome was posted and as well, you could get samples uh, from BEI and uh, order, order proteins and antibodies. Um, and then, then basically it's just putting the assay together and, and running it through the chip. Um, and in some sense, that's what the sort of the commercial companies that have been FDA authorized have been doing, right? They took the existing boxes, the existing PCR machines, uh, waited until the reagents were built. And then so tests were actually available, have been available for a while. It just was a matter of how many and how good they were. Um, now, for, for our particular device, uh, it's not necessarily just tied to COVID, but I, I think our results on the, on the, in the research lab are, are really good. And uh, they show things that haven't been done before, but that's different from a clinical test that people have to rely on. And uh, so it basically our site, we were commercializing the devices as, as is. And so until, the, but we don't have a product on that yet, but you basically need to have a working box product to quickly then adapt for a new disease, right? It's okay, right, right. If that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, one last very quick question and quick answer um, that you could give and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, are there any potential non-medical applications? So for example, um, toxicology, uh, water, water purity, uh, you mentioned air, uh, very briefly, you mentioned air right at the beginning. Yes, uh, so water, I think most uh, obvious and immediate ones would be a water quality monitoring or food safety or egg safety. Uh, we've, been, we've been talking to people about looking for disease in potatoes, for example. Mm -hmm. Just this right. one, not directly medical. <laughs> Could turn into medical if it's a bad potato. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Holger. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. And uh, I appreciate that you've taken the time to share it with us. So I'll turn it back to, to George. Well, thank you very much, Alex. And thank you, Holger, for a fascinating lecture. I wanna thank our audience for coming tonight and remind you that uh, there will be a video. Uh, there is a video recording of this will be emailed to you. Please join us next month for our next crawl lecture, preparing for future climate change, lessons from the past with Professor James Zakos. That lecture will be on November 18th. Good night, everyone.